Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Bill Kent University Library Art Gallery, and welcome to the first of our library lunchtime lectures for this academic year. I am very, very happy to uh, introduce a colleague, but also uh, a Facebook friend, <laughs> a friend in other sense as well, uh, Dr. Thomas Zimmerman, uh, who will be speaking to us shortly. Uh, all that glitters is not gold, or all that sparkles silver, or particularly ancient Anatolian jewellery unveiled. And I can't get away with these without giving one bad joke. I'm sure this will be a gem of a lecture, and if he will give us, he will deliver in a sparkling oh, style, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll give you very briefly some information about our speaker, and then I shall let him take over, because I know he's got a lot of things to share with us today. Uh, Thomas Zimmerman did his undergraduate uh, studies in pre- and proto-history, uh, European ethnology and classical archaeology at the Universität Regensburg in Germany. He then pursued his doctoral research at the Romanisch germanisch Central Museum Mainz. Please don't uh, That's okay. uh, 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 <laughs> tell me off for my bad pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, during that time, as a student, he did visit Bill Kent as a, uh, an exchange student in 1998 to 99 uh, at the archaeology department. And obviously, uh, whether it was the Department of Archaeology here or Bill Kent in general uh, attracted him so much that subsequently he's, uh, he's been uh, a full time uh, instructor and later assistant professor since 2003. He came back, and we're both happy that he did. Uh, he's published extensively in the field of ancient Anatolian uh, archaeology, a number of books authored and co edited. Uh, and many articles in English and German. His research interests include the science in archaeology, early metallurgy, uh, Anatolian prehistory, and the history of archaeological methodology. Um, in addition to these academic uh, interests, uh, Thomas has informed us that he's a great fan of uh, James Bond movies. And for those of you from the UK, and uh, maybe some Turks know as well, uh, the British uh, science fiction series Doctor Who. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> yes. That and he Star Wars. Uh, mechanical watches, old watches, old maps, and Star Wars memorabilia. Okay, that's enough for me. We shall hopefully have five or ten minutes maximum at the end for, for questions. Uh, okay, just I've reminded myself, please switch your phones off, switch them to silent mode and so on, so we don't interrupt the talk. Okay, Thomas, good luck. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, good afternoon everybody. A warm welcome to all of you. We just learned that I have to compete with Kemal Kilicdarulu, who is giving now a talk. Uh, at the same time, at the director's building, and uh, well, my presentation will be much less uh, political eventually. Uh, well, you will see the, a few explicit pictures to come up, but in a, a probably different political context. Uh, now, uh, what I plan to do here for the upcoming 40, 45 something minutes is to take you on a journey uh, from yeah, a journey through space and time uh, which will finally end up in Anatolia, modern Turkey and its modern political borders. And if you go back in time to about 1,900,000 years BC, uh, here, depending on which theory you pursue, either in the savannas of Africa or in the Caucasus, in uh, modern Georgia, we have the birth of what we could say modern man or a close relative, not so dist uh, um, distant relative of ours, the Homo erectus. Here, um, artistic rendering of this uh, species Homo, which um, mastered to walk on two legs, came to fire, and started producing tools. Nothing but tools that you can use as weapons, as tools to cut flesh, to crush bone, or also to kill the next of kin. However, the story of early archaeology, the story of Paleolithic archaeology, is basically the story of stone, of stone tools, of stone tools and eventually weapons, nothing else. But a few, very, very few artifacts which do not fit that well into the picture, uh, incised bone eventually uh, from uh, lower paleolithic contexts, 
dated to about 350, 380,000 BC. But basically, we have nothing else than the equipment that allows man to survive. Nothing else. Nothing that shows us that people eventually adorned themselves, that they had a different perspective on life than only to survive in the very difficult environment they had to cope with in these ages. This changes then at around 60,000 BC. And let's move now to the far south of Africa, to a fine spot which is known as the Blombos Cave, which was eventually inhabited by our next of kin, our relative, the Homo sapiens. There are only a handful of teeth from this site, but these teeth match pretty well the size of teeth that we have as modern humans. So since there's no bone, no other fossil material preserved there uh, from the groups that, um, that uh, lived there for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and came back after hunting, there's nothing else but, yeah, again, a variety of stone tools neatly shaped, these um, uh, flint uh, items, these flint artifacts, again used for hunting, cutting, scraping, but we also have bone material, something new in the archaeological assemblage. After hundreds and thousands of years of only dealing with stone, 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 and nothing but stone, now we have also bone items in the archaeological assemblage, and ochre. Ochre, lumps of ochre which are shaped and incised, and probably for the first time in the history of humans, something we can identify as simple jewelry. These maritime shells that are perforated, pierced, that can be put up on a string, as the reconstruction shows here, uh, fished out of the sea and used as a simple type of jewelry. So man starts to decorate him or herself, to adorn him or herself in this particular age. And then when we move a bit further to the north, to north of Africa, the Levant, and Eurasia, well, we encounter another close relative of ours, the Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthal, which is basically known, or in uh, yeah, the public image as to say, understood as a very grumpy, very, yeah, the type of caveman cliche uh, being which is not necessarily true. This is a modern reconstruction of uh, how we have to imagine this uh, species here, the Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthal. And if we compare the skeletal material that we know from this period with the fossil remains of modern humans, there's not so much difference indeed. A bigger nose, a different physical build to cope with the still difficult climatic conditions. It's very cold, it's very dry. You have a big nose. If you inhale the air, it will warm and do less damage to your lungs, for example, or to your throat. And, well, the truth is, and we know this since a couple of years, that we are much closer to the species that we ever imagined. Because each and every of us, we all do carry a bit of Neanderthal heritage. Because there was interbreeding somewhere here, presumably in the Levant, where the species Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthal, met with the Homo sapiens, who left Africa here about 80,000 years ago. Interbreeding took place. And as a result, we all do carry a little bit of 
Neanderthal heritage with us. That's the truth. Well, if you think about modern neo-Nazis, claiming themselves to be the pinnacle of the human race as the pure Aryans, I always think it might be quite funny to see that, well, if you want to see a pristine example of a Homo sapiens, please go to Africa, to the Maasai. That's where they are. <laughs> I always think it's a bit of a funny footnote if one thinks about, um, yeah, is uh, neo-Nazi groups claiming themselves to be a superior Aryan white race. Let's finally move to Turkey. Here, to the Üç Asli cave, uh, close to the Bay of Iskenderun. And here, an expedition which uh, started in the 1990s and is still ongoing, we again have here, yeah, material that we could identify as early jewelry items. Again, a type of maritime shell and other types of shells that were used, that were pierced, that were perforated to be used as jewelry. Put on yourself. That's a big, yeah, uh, how to say, intellectually, but had and testifies to a very different perspective in the life of early humans. And then if we move further on in time to this crucial year, uh, 10,000 BC, something very profound happens because the lifestyle that was led by early humans, by our close and remote ancestors for millions of years to be mobile, to be hunters and gatherers. This is abandoned and replaced by something that is much more risky. You settle down. And there's still no straightforward exp uh, exploration for that, why this actually happened. Because there's no real evolutionary advantage in that. It's much more risky to settle down. You have to plan into the future. You have to develop new strategies. You have to develop new technologies to plow your fields to domesticate the animals, to domesticate plants to feed the animals, and so on and so forth. But this happened at the end of the final Pleistocene period, at the end of the Ice Age, and the beginning of the modern Holocene climatic setting with all its major and minor fluctuations. But this is the period that we still find ourselves in. And these earliest sedentary communities or communities which fall into this transitional period of being mobile and starting settling down like this side here in, uh, the, on the southern Anatolian plateau, Pinarbashi, we have here a slightly greater variety of different types of yeah, shell jewelry, of shell adornments like this dentalia here, or this type of seashell, which was imported from the Mediterranean region. So we have early trade represented here, and also a step-by-step advanced stage of decorating, of adorning yourself. Other sites that are very early, that belong to the earliest phase of the Neolithic, the earliest phase of the sedentary period in mankind history, like Chayunu in uh, the, uh, the east, southeast of modern Turkey, or Ashiklihuyuk here in Cappadocia, <coughs> with different solutions, hoping with different environments here. These um, buildings, rectangular, freestanding buildings with limestone foundations, and these peculiar grill shaped or cell shaped inner structures, or is a difference here in, uh, on the central Anatolian plateau, mud brick buildings, densely clustered, uh, a large settlement here at Ashiklihuyuk. So different types of coping with the environment, different strategies to settle down, but now we have a new stage, a new phase in the creation, the production of early jewelry. 
We have here different types of stone beads, hematite, different types of greenstone represented here, little pendants, beads, biconically shaped, tubular shaped, and fascinating, indeed, the earliest evidence for working with metal, working with copper. Dated here to the late 9th and 8th millennia BC. Copper beads from, in that case, chai unu, or little inlays, made of cold worked and annealed copper, as we say. This is not real metal technology yet. This is the experimental, the initial stage of shaping metals. What people do is they find this new exciting material made of copper, pick it up, and shape it in desired shapes, like little beads and, and pendants or inlays here. So they treat it the same way like stone. There is no smelting technology yet. They treat it the same way as they would treat uh, flintstone. So they hammer it, cold hammering as we say, or they anneal it. That means they heat it in the fire to shape it more easily. It's not smelting yet, but it's the right step in the right direction to achieve this goal. And we only have these predecessors here on Anatolian grounds, nowhere else in the world. Only here we have earliest evidence for the experimental dealing and treatment of copper. Why does earliest metalwork start with copper? Well, there's a straightforward answer to that. It's the most abundant metal in the world. <laughs> it's related to the geological history of our planet. Here's some more examples for jewelry, in that case, from Ashiklihyuk, here close to Aksaray in southern central Anatolia. Carniol beads and early copper beads. Again, worked in the same way as the material from Chayunu. So here we have earliest advances in technology, in human innovation, also related with jewelry making. I think not unimportant to mention that. Another beautiful example, different material that people work with, but utterly beautiful indeed, marble bracelets from Jaferhük. Um, in um, <clears throat> southern Turkey, close to the Taurus Mountains here, we have fragments. You see how beautifully these objects were executed. Beautifully shaped and polished. You could still wear them nowadays. It would look rather chic, probably. And they were made here also at a very, very early stage in sedentary history in the late 9th and 8th millennia BC. Another example which shows that people diversify or the business that are people doing diversifies comes here from the Neolithic side of Kushkuyuk, close to Mide, again in southern central Anatolia. Here from Kushkuyuk we have probably one of the oldest, probably the oldest clearly identifiable workshop for this type of beads, a special quarter reserved in the building for shaping and executing this stone jewelry here. We have also little workshops for treatment copper from Chaiuni, which is even older, but here these copper items were used for different purposes, so to make little beads and pendants, but also inlays for probably wooden uh, items. But here we have a workshop exclusively designed, exclusively reserved for creating stone jewelry. Oops, that's here, exactly. Now, around 5000 BC, again, something fundamentally important happens because Around 5000 BC, the great technological breakthrough is performed at a site called Mersin Yumuktepe, modern Mersin, 
For the first time here in Anatolian prehistory, man managed to successfully smelt copper from the ore. We have the earliest cast smelted copper artifacts here from this side. No jewelry, but tools like uh, axes and, well, as a jewelry item, probably uh, a fragment of a pin. But here, this important breakthrough is performed that copper is now not treated like stone, but as a separate material which you can manipulate in a much different way as stone. You can liquefy it, you can shape it in a much different way, you can pour it into molds and then make all kinds of beautiful things with it. This happens around 5000 BC, again here on Anatolian grounds. And then a first, let's say, apogee, a first high point in metal production and consumption and also specifically jewelry making is reached at the mid of the third millennium BC, around 2500 BC. I give you two examples that you probably also heard of before, at least one here, Troy, is sure enough known also to people with not such a keen interest in archaeology. Here from Troy, we have the famous, infamous Priam's treasure, so-called Priam's treasure, uh, which is actually more than 17 different uh, caches of metal, uh, gold, silver, and stone artifacts retrieved in 1873 when Heinrich Schliemann, this businessman and self-made archaeologist, worked there and discovered this huge cache of metal items. Here, uh, the famous iconic photograph of his second wife, Sofia Egastrominos, wearing the jewelry with, uh, I would say, a bit of a wary facial expression here. He doesn't seem to be very happy about what the husband did to her, but it's an iconic picture here um, that is uh, well known, I think, uh, wearing this beautiful uh, jewelry. He does lots of discussion about especially this particular uh, cache of items here. It's, uh, well, as you probably know, not in Turkey anymore. It's also not in Athens and not in Berlin, where it was brought before. It's now in Moscow, in Moscow, in the Pushkin Museum, and eventually remains there until further notice. There were lots of negotiations going on to repatriate this important find, but uh, not very much is happening for the time being, unfortunately. Uh, the story of the recovery is also a bit difficult to, um, to analyze because, well, Schliemann kept very detailed diaries and he had a very colorful story about uh, the, the day, the 31st of May, 1873, when he found this treasure and then he called his wife, Sophia, and he hid this treasure in her, in her skirt, in her clothes, and, and brought it away. Well, the truth is that we also know from another entry in another diary of Schliemann that his wife was not there. He wa she was in Athens. <laughs> so the problem is now to what degree Schliemann, well, we know that he lied to us in some cases, but the question is, did he lie also about the origin of this? There are theories that this was bought on the antiques market in Istanbul, which already existed at this time. Uh, it's a bit of a difficult story, but uh, well, after years and years of intensive research, we can say that, well, this jewelry, especially the jewelry items, are very much Aegean, very much, yeah, northwestern Anatolian in type, and they are most probably indeed from Troy. There are 17,000 items. The largest one is this Omphalos bowl here, and the smallest ones are little. Uh, copper and, and, and gold nails uh, made to eventually decorate wooden furniture, for example. Uh, many of these things are still not very thoroughly restored. Um, they are still stored like that 
in uh, the museum in Moscow. Now let's look at some of these wonderful items. And again, we have represented here some of the very firsts in jewelry making. This hairdress here, neatly executed. Or here, these pendants with this flute, uh, this, this winged tubular be uh, beads, which have a very, very widespread distribution, by the way. It seems to be a very simple shape, but you can find this particular type of bead distributed from the Indus Valley as far as Europe, also illustrating yeah, trade and exchange here, international, interregional, indeed international trade and exchange in the third millennium BC. If we have look at the details here, we have a technique that is still used in jewelry making, but here we see it for the very, very first time. Loop in loop application of this tiny chains here. Loop in loop technology represented for the first time here with this jewelry. Some more examples here, elaborate uh, ear uh, rings or decoration with this pendants here attached. Well, I'm always a little bit careful with this straightforward uh, archaeological explanation on, uh, regarding shape and intention. Uh, there are a, a few colleagues who see a phallic symbol in there, a phallus symbol. I'm a bit careful with this interpretation. Probably archaeology is still a bit too much male-based uh, endeavor. However, whatever they represent here, a few more examples to illustrate uh, this beautiful execution of this gold jewelry here. Another first that we see in jewelry making is this technology applied here to this, uh, to this earring granulation. So to apply little drops of gold to the still surface of the actual body of the jewelry. Also something that we see here for the very first time. So more examples for this um, technology here from the third millennium BC to be seen as Troy. Here more examples for, uh, for this technique applied to these um, elaborate earrings here. Uh, there are still uh, you have to imagine, oops, where were we? I think here, yes. Um, uh, chains attached here to the perforations. Uh, some more examples, and here again to illustrate this technique, which is very difficult. You see, it, it didn't work out very well because the little drops of gold they flew together. Granulation is a very uh, is a very delicate technique, uh, but it was executed here in most cases very, very well. A few more examples of beautiful gold jewelry from Troy, another ring here with granulation applied to the surface, another bracelet here with a typical symbol of the third and also the second millennium BC, the double spiral that we see applied here to this bracelet, and then yeah, uh, something that gives us a bit of an idea what type of people these were, both that were making the jewelry and the ones that were ordering the jewelry. Now, this is very regional. These are oversized, huge pins, dress fasteners, but you wouldn't see them in any other place. Very exaggerated, very much uh, uh, oversized here. This. Uh, rectangular of the pin uh, then crowned with this group of spouted pitchers of miniature vessels and another example of such an oversized pin. Um, now we do not have any predecessors at the settlement of Troy which was settled since the beginning of the third millennium BC. So this is something completely different that occurs here. A totally different quality, a totally different style which emerges here with no predecessors in metal technology in Troy. We do have metal production since the early third millennium BC at Troy, but nothing, nothing we could compare with the pristine manufacture of the 
of this gold jewelry. So it seems that who made them, these were kind of itinerary craftsmen who traveled from side to side to supply the local elites which emerged there in the third millennium and to satisfy the yeah, personal or regional fashion. Uh, one can compare this a little bit with, yeah, I took this picture here with this kind of oversized, generated wrap jewelry uh, this man is wearing here. So to say it in a diplomatic way, it's, it's oversized, it's exaggerated, and no one in Mesopotamia would eventually wear this kind of thing. But the regional population in Troy, they were fond of this kind of oversized, strange shapes. So we see here, obviously, a local elite emerging, getting rich because of trade, because of the strategic position that Troy had, controlling the way through the Dardanelles Strait, and when they had enough resources to hire the specialists, which were most probably not of Trojan, not of Northwestern Anatolian origin, they ordered this type of jewelry, which was executed there in this beautiful fashion. We have also traces of the craftsmen who did this, because part of this huge treasure finds are, yeah, unfinished items. These little wires here, ingots, ready to be worked, ready to be processed by the metal worker, by the goldsmith, but unfinished. Also, these rods here, which are little ingots, gold ingots, to be further processed, to be further transformed into the jewelry that was then made. Also, this uh, twisted wire here is not a finished object, but a prefabric. Also, these little rings here um, are not the finished object, but little ingots, the raw material for the metal worker there. One asks itself the question, how is it possible to do these things without a magnifying glass? Because what I showed you, this little loop-in-loop loop technique, for the naked eye, it's, it's, it's too tiny. It's very difficult to work with it. This might be the answer to the question, because we also have this rock crystal lenses, question mark, uh, associated with some of the findings there. So these were probably the magnifying glasses for the goldsmith who worked with this material and managed to do this very, very tiny decoration, the granulation, or also the loop-in-loop -loop chains here for this uh, magnificent headdress. Another site here, not too far away from Ankara, in the Chorum district, Alajahuk, with its so-called royal graves, which were excavated in the 1930s by the first generation of Turkish archaeologists, have also here uh, beautifully, beautiful jewelry associated. A few examples here with quadruple spirals, this pin with uh, carniol beads attached and a, a gilded hat. A few more examples here, this nice uh, twins holding hands and um, another dress fastener here in, a, uh, in the shape of a nade. Another beautiful jewelry item here with uh, carniol beads attached, some more gold jewelry from the burials of Alajahuyuk, and another picture here to illustrate the beauty of this jewelry. One has to stress here that uh, according to the anthropological analysis of the burials, only one of the buried persons here in these 14 graves were probably a woman. The others were males. Males loved to adorn themselves. We have this also later on in the, uh, in the Iron Age, in Europe, and in other regions. So here, this is not an exclusively female uh, fashion or female custom, but it's definitely also the males for certain occasions that um, wore these things or the bereaved thought that 
these people should be represented like that because, as you know, you never decide for yourself what to put in your grave because you are dead. You cannot decide this anymore. It's the bereaved who decide how to equip your funeral. So this beautiful jewelry tradition is also not only represented at uh, larger sites, at centers like al or Troy, also in smaller sites in the vicinity of the centers like Resololo and Kalenkaya. Kalenkaya is just a few kilometers away, three, four kilometers away from al Resololo, also in the Chorum district, is located a bit further to the northwest. Here's the necropolis of Resololo in the stage of excavation. You see this huge pitoi, a typical, so these huge vessels where the dead were squeezed in. This is the typical funeral tradition of the third millennium. Here is such an individual from one of these pitoi, from one of these huge vessels equipped with kinds of different items. This uh, twisted torque here as uh, uh, jewelry worn, another broken piece of uh, copper-based jewelry, a twisted dagger, and a partly squeezed and destroyed little jug. Interesting to note here is that many of these objects are intentionally broken and twisted. So it's not uh, the result of an unskilled excavator, but this is the way how things were treated before they were given into the grave to deprofanize them, or to reprofanize them, to make them not beautiful or useful for a potential grave robber. Grave robbery is not a modern endeavor, it's something that also existed in antiquity. So we have many of these things torn and twisted when they are given into the grave. Here, examples of jewelry from these burials, again with a combination of copper-based beads and uh, carniol and the material which turned out to be uzonite, uh, um, a yellowish mineral which is known from the Taurus Mountains and there are some outcrops also on the Black Sea coast, but this is obviously uzonite which was used here for this yellow beads. Uh, two examples here from uh, the site of Kalenkaya here, an opened ceramic uh, 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 container, so-called pitos, with the squeezed-in burial here lying inside. Examples for local jewelry produced here, a combination of stone, of uh, here uh, carniol, and also bronze or copper bait beads, which were used here to make this jewelry. And amongst these items are things that look at first sight like silver and gold. That would be the observation here done with the naked eye. You say, this is gold, this is silver. You agree? Well, it's not as easy as that. There's a wonderful modern methodology to reveal the true chemical composition of things. It's called X-ray fluorescence. What you do here with such a portable device which looks a little bit like a science fiction gun here, is you <clears throat> measure the chemical contents, the chemical composition of an artifact without doing any harm to it. And it can reveal very nicely the actual chemical composition, the elements, the materials that were used to make these items. It turned out that this silver looking ring was actually copper, gold, and a bit of silver alloyed together silver stretched with a larger amount of copper, and these are actually copper-rich silver uh, items plated with gold. And even better, all these beautiful gold vessels that we know from the site of al from the burials, from the graves of al which look like massive gold vessels here. This is a nice spot, again, decorated with carniol here. Well, modern analysis showed us that these are not gold vessels. These are gold-plated, copper-rich silver vessels. 
and the silver is not even very pure. It's mixed, it's alloyed, it's stretched considerably with copper. So it's a bit of a fake <laughs> tradition that evolves here already in the third millennium BC. So modern analysis, modern methodology helps us to get a very different idea of ancient technologies, of ancient metalworking, and also, of course, of ancient jewelry making. The technologies developed in the early millennia in Anatolia, especially the first high point of metal and jewelry production in the third millennium, is maintained also in the later millennia in the second and first millennia BC. A few examples of old Assyrian and Hittite jewelry. It's a big, 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 big exception to have anything like Hittite jewelry here from a regular excavation. The problem is that at uh, settlements, at sites, we normally don't find very much metal items for the simple reason that people didn't throw them away, of course. Uh, they kept them or put them into burials, which is the big problem that we have with the Hittites. They lived, but they never died. We have no burials from the Hittite times, and henceforth also uh, very few jewelry items. This is from a settlement here from Ortaköy, Shapinuva. In the first millennium, then, iron is also used not only for weapons and tools, but also for jewelry items. It might have looked very nicely when it was produced, but iron is pretty problematic, as you know. It corrodes very badly. So what comes from first millennium burials here, examples from eastern Turkey, this does not look very nice anymore after a couple of hundred or thousand years. Well, uh, here again, just to finish, uh, beautiful examples of gold jewelry from the first millennium from western Turkey, uh, from uh, the Lydian Empire, from the Lydian Kingdom here. Beautiful gold beads with uh, lapis lazuli inlays, beautifully executed. But as I told you, the very basics for, let's say, modern professional jewelry making and jewelry production, the foundations were laid in the third millennium BC, were already perfectionized in the third millennium BC. So the taste in how to decorate or adorn yourself and to decorate your body might have changed in the past millennia, but it's, I think, important to note and important to stress that Anatolia plays a very important role in the development and perfection of important technologies and innovations, amongst other also jewelry making. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, the best I can do is my library staff ID badge, I'm afraid. But uh, <laughs> um, we have maybe a few minutes. I know some of you may have classes shortly, but we have a few minutes for, for questions before we have to finish. So. Anyone wish to start us off with a question for Thomas? Okay. Yeah. Sorry if I just missed it, but uh, about these crystals that has magnification effect, uh -huh. were they found in context somewhere? They were part of these of this, uh, hordes that Schliemann uh, eventually excavated in 1873. The problem is that we have no very detailed documentation. They were included in this huge cache of items. It was possible now in the past decades to reconstruct the original finds, but it was never only one big cache of items. There were at least 17 different complexes. In one of these complexes, we have this yeah, raw material for the goldsmith and also this rock crystal things that eventually served as lenses. Well, it's published like that. One has to really check whether this might have a magnifying effect. But the point is that to execute these very, very tiny chains and to bend the, the gold wires with the naked eye, it seems impossible. It's just too small. So you need some magnifying effect. And since glass was not used, especially, uh, well, at least not a glass with a magnifying effect in this time, these rock crystal lenses might be 
uh, an answer to this question. Yes, please. Um, I have a question about the Scythian jewelry. In comparison to the Anatolian or Mediterranean jewelry in general, mm -hmm. uh, how do you evaluate the Scythian jewelry um, in, in value and in technical aspects? Uh, I should say. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately... Some, so which are from the Hermitage Museum, for example. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, unfortunately, I didn't show any Scythian jewelry here. <laughs> But in terms of uh, Scythian styles and Scythian applications, this is all, if you see Scythian jewelry and if you see Scythian ornaments, they're immediately identifiable. It's really something that has its place in the Eurasian steppes and was definitely also uh, developed there. Now, uh, in the case of metal technology, one has to say that Anatolia is the only place where we have also this very early experimental stages represented. In all the other places in the world, we have early copper smelting attempts, successful smelting attempts, and there's the discussion whether these things uh, have developed multilocally, so independent from each other, or whether there is one core or one origin for this technology which then spread to the other parts of the world, especially with metal technology, we now have for copper smelting very, very, very early evidence from Serbia, uh, from the Balkans, uh, which eventually even predates uh, the 5,000, uh, now 7,000 year old successful smelting attempt in uh, Mersin Yumuk Tepe. So there is a possibility that uh, this uh, at one point was just realized by the people. Uh, that you can manipulate metal in a much different way than you can manipulate stone. A big question is, of course, also, uh, well, smelting of metal, this does not really work if you just throw things into the fire. It's not hot enough. <laughs> so you need you apply oxygen uh, to reach the temperature. For copper, it's 1,080 centigrade, I think, uh, to, to liquefy it, to smelt it. Uh, so how this really uh, happened, this is uh, still uh, subject, to, uh, subject to debate, whether it's really a, co a great combination of coincidence. You light a campfire, you throw some copper beads in, and then whoosh, a storm comes up and heats this thing <laughs> to over 1,000 degrees. We don't know. For Scythian jewelry again, here from the first millennium BC, <coughs> We have, of course, uh, a very intense exchange of technologies and ideas, especially in this time. We have from the, from the famous so-called Midas tumulus, which is his father Gordius was actually buried there, but we have wooden, uh, uh, wooden furniture, uh, which is kind of camping furniture that you can flip and wrap and pack together. This is nothing that was developed in Anatolia. This is something that comes from the steppe riders to carry things with them. So we always know in a big uh, narrative of history about invasions and the Scythians invaded Anatolia and the Scythians destroyed this and that. Uh, there's more to that than only skirmishes and warfare. There's also an exchange of, of ideas. <laughs> take, yeah, take, Austrian coffee culture, if the Turks would never have knocked on the doors of Vienna, there wouldn't be something like coffee culture. <laughs> so there's not only this, this belligerent element, there's also the exchange of technologies and ideas, and the Scythians and also the Anatolian party benefited from that. Well, I mean, I'm just going to a very short question. Yeah, yeah, because we need to finish now. Okay, yeah. well, uh, like, uh, as, as far as I know, he mm. might live for 600 years in this country, and he said no burials were found. You mean, like, no burials with, with uh, like, no burials at all? Or no burials it's, with the whole... Well, well what we know about the Hittites, actually, what do we know about the Hittites? It's the upper class. It's the people who reside in the big cities. We know the centers. We know the centers. We know very, very, very little about rural life, about the commoners in the countryside. So not we a do, single grade? I mean, no, we have, we have, there's no, no very, we have a description of very complex rituals that were performed when a queen and a king died, but what then happened to the body was incinerated, was cremated, the ashes blew into the air, whatever. We have no burial from the, what we could call a Hittite burial. We do have the continuation of this Pitos burial well into the second millennium in the countryside. 
And we have uh, the impression that uh, certain customs, fashions, um, they continued throughout. They were not affected by Hittite rule because some of the pottery that occurs then at the first millennium after the collapse of the Hittite Empire looks pretty much like the pottery that we have in the third millennium. So very little change probably in the countryside. What we know is just a cutout of the social reality, the big cities, the elites in the big cities. But from there, no graves, no burials, no nothing, until further notice. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So if you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.